All right, well, good evening, everybody. We're going to go ahead and begin our class tonight, part one on understanding the supernatural. And so just curious, who was here uh, the last couple of weeks, actually three weeks for the three enemies class? You came to any of those. Just wave at me if you were. Okay. All right. Fantastic. You guys are gluttons for punishment. Good. All right. So must not have been too bad. You came back for some more. Um, just uh, a little uh, disclaimer, if you were here last week for the uh, class, um, you're probably going to hear a few of the same stories. Uh, so repetition's good, right? I mean, that's how we learn. So there's no formation without repetition. So, um, so you're going to hear a few things again. Uh, let me pray for us, and we're going to dive uh, right into God's Word. Heavenly Father, thank you for an evening that we could come together in the middle of probably for most of us, all of us, a busy week, lots of things on our minds and hearts. Right now, we just want to slow down and quiet our hearts and our minds, and we give you whatever the thing is that we came in here with tonight, whether we're just tired from a long day or whether there are some real uh, concerns, things going on. Lord, we just give you our cares because you said you care for us. And we want to be here tonight fully present with you uh, to learn from you, Jesus, learn about your ways, learn about this uh, kingdom, uh, particularly the unseen world that you have created and that you uh, are moving and active in. So we just ask that you would be our teacher and our guide, uh, that you would uh, be uh, just opening our hearts and our minds and I pray even for some of us, expanding our, our understanding and our faith, uh, maybe in some new ways tonight. So we give it all to you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. 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 All right. Still have a few folks coming in. We've got a couple of seats up front here, uh, and a couple here if you're looking for a table to take notes on. And so um, we will take a break somewhere on the halfway point of tonight. Uh, I'll try to give us a break, about five minutes sort of to stretch and get some snacks or water or whatever if you need them. And um, this is going to be drinking from a fire hose tonight. I just need to apologize right up front. Uh, this particular class, Understanding the Supernatural, is jam-packed. Uh, it's a two-part class, uh, but I'm going to be trying to just kind of move us through a lot of scripture, a lot of understanding on a variety of things. And so um, hopefully you will take notes. Uh, again, if, if you didn't grab uh, something to take notes on, there are pads of paper and pens out there. Also, uh, if you want some review after tonight, we're videoing uh, both of these sessions this week and also next week. And at a certain point, and hopefully not too distant future, we're going to post those on the New Heights website. So you can go back and listen to it again. Or if you, for some reason, are going to miss next week, uh, you can go back and watch that. But being here in person is going to be uh, the best experience, so come back next week. All right. Um, what we're going to talk about tonight is just really coming into what I hope is a biblical understanding of the things that we experience around us. And so I'm just going to start with our felt, uh, just our felt reality. So right now you're sitting in a chair. You can feel that chair. Uh, maybe you're leaning on your table. You can feel that table. Uh, we have been given five senses, uh, our taste, our smell, our touch, all of those things. We're given those five senses uh, by God. We've been given these bodies, these eyes, these ears. Uh, we're able to touch things and feel things, hopefully, if all your senses, five senses are working. Um, and, and God has given these to us to perceive the reality that is the physical world around us. So, uh, so we all just started at that baseline. Um, but, but what we have to also understand is that there is more that more than just our five senses uh, can inform us about. And so uh, what we're going to specifically talk about tonight are these two realms uh, that we're going to describe. So the physical realm uh, is the one that we all are very familiar with. It's the non-physical realm. Uh, that's probably why you're here in this class, right? Because <laughs> you sense there's more. Hopefully you sense that than just the physical world around you. And your Bible 
it, it paints a picture, a very clear picture, of a reality that you can't necessarily touch with your five senses. And so we're going to call that the non-physical, or it's the material world and the spirit world or the spiritual world. So let's just begin right at the very start of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, we're told, in the beginning, God. So right there, reality starts with an invisible God who speaks and makes things out of nothing. So things went from invisible to visible. He spoke, it came to being, and it says that he created the heavens and the earth. How many of you, when you've read this uh, before, sometimes when it, you see that word heavens, you start to think like outer space, like what's up there, right? You know, just that, that means the heavens, like the sky and the clouds and, you know, the stars and all that. Yes, uh, Genesis ref is referring to uh, that space, the universe that God has created, the galaxies, etc. But in the Jewish understanding of this verse, and this is who it was originally uh, given to, uh, scholars believe it was written by Moses, and it was written uh, for the people of Israel and to be a testimony to the nations around them. But when they read the word heavens, that meant more than just outer space. That was talking about realities in the unseen world. So, so the heavens is more than just outer space. But let's talk about this earth that God has created. The physical world testifies to us, it should, testify to us about the invisible realities of the spiritual world. It testifies to us about the realities of God. And the Apostle Paul clearly says this in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. It says, since the creation of the world. So Paul takes this all the way back to the beginning, to where we started, Genesis 1. He says, the invisible qualities of God. So again, he's invisible, but these qualities about him, his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without an excuse. So what Paul is seeing here is that our physical world around us points to spiritual realities. And you don't have to be a Christian to understand this. Are you with me? Which, by the way, this is an interactive class. The more that you guys participate with me when I ask questions like, are you with me? Uh, and you say, yeah, come on, try it. Are you with me? Yeah, okay. So I'll preach better. I'll teach better if you guys interact with me. Seriously. So, um, so do you have to be a Christian to understand that the physical world points to something else? No, you don't have to be a Christian. I mean, just go to Colorado, hang out, you know, uh, in the mountains a while, and you're going to run into a whole bunch of hippies out there who they don't care a lick about Jesus, but they're, gonna, they're, they're basically going, we're connecting with something here. Do you feel that vibe? Do you see it? Like, you know, they're just, they're, they're like, we're, we're kind of trying to connect with something. Uh, and, and they're not completely wrong because the physical creation has the fingerprints of God all over it. And that's really what Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. So God creates this physical world, but he also creates an invisible world. And the Apostle Paul speaks very clearly to this reality in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. So Paul's writing about Jesus, but he says, Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Just like God spoke and, and the material world was created, so Jesus, who is eternally the word of God from eternity past, comes into our reality so that the invisible God can be made known. He came to basically say, you guys want to know what God is like? Look at me. What you see me doing, that's what, that's what the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit's what we, we've been doing since, since the beginning. And it says, he existed before anything was created, and he's supreme over all of the creation. For through him, God created everything, and here he goes, in the heavenly realms, which is more than outer, outer space, and on the earth. He made the things that we can see, you know, five senses, and he made things that we can't see, 
And then he goes into this list and he starts talking about things that we read and we go, what are you talking about, Paul? He starts talking about thrones. You're like, well, what kind of thrones? There are invisible thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. You're like, okay. Paul's, Paul's dialed into something here that we really don't understand a whole lot about. He says, everything was created through him, Jesus, and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all of creation together. He holds all of creation together. So if I were to ask you tonight, um, and maybe if, if you're taking notes, I'll just give you 20 or 30 seconds uh, to think about or even to write down in your notes the answer to this question. What do you understand right now here? What is your understanding of the invisible world? Like what's there in the invisible world? How do you understand it? What do you believe to be real or true about the invisible world? So if you're taking notes, just take, take 20 seconds, jot some things down. What kind of things are there? What's it like? Um, if you're not taking notes, you can just think about it. So just take, take a few seconds. Okay, as you're, as you're uh, writing some things down or thinking about that, um, somebody just tell me just really loud, uh, hopefully the camera will pick it up, um, what's there in the, besides God, okay, we'll take that for granted, you know, God, God is there in the invisible world. What else is in the invisible world? Somebody shout to me, what's in the invisible world? Angels, okay, great, what else? Holy Spirit, demons, yeah, okay. Now, you guys just said some, you just named some things that, that there are people who would um, claim the name of Christ, uh, who if, if you look at the polls, people will, will take polls on this kind of stuff. There are people who claim the name of Christ who go, I'm not sure I believe in that stuff. I'm not sure I believe in angels. I'm not sure that I believe in demons. Or I'm not sure the devil's doing anything today because Jesus defeated him 2,000 years ago at the cross. And so he's not doing anything. And there's a whole spectrum of, of um, you know, things that people believe about the things that you just said. You know, um, there were a group of religious leaders in Jesus' day who did not believe in angels or demons. Can anybody tell you what that religious group, who they were? The Sadducees, yes. They were, they were these Jewish leaders claiming to follow God, believe in the Bible, and yet their view of reality was very different. Um, from, from what the Bible says is real. Okay, let me, let me just kind of take a little bit of time to talk about some of the things you guys just mentioned. Let's talk about angels first. Uh, we uh, see in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7, some description of angels. In speaking of the angels, God says, He makes His angels spirits. So they, they're spirit beings. I'm just going to use that phrase, spirit beings. Um, they are spirit beings. They have personalities. Uh, they make decisions. They can communicate. Uh, and um, it says his servants flames of fire. And so there are these spirit beings called angels. And their first and foremost job, if you will, in that authority structure that Paul was describing is they are servants. Isn't that cool? They are the servants in the spirit world, the angels. They serve God. They serve his purposes. Uh, and, it, and it describes them here as flames of fire. And there's some, some kind of apocalyptic language that you'll see in some places like Ezekiel or Daniel or the book of Revelation. And it describes angels as like these awesome beings. Some of them kind of almost look like, you know, they've got wings or different eyes or they look like wheels moving around. Here's the bottom line. They are shapeshifters. I mean, that's my extrapolation. Is it okay to say that? That's not science fiction. They can appear in human form. And the Bible even tells us that people can entertain angels and not even be aware that they're actually heavenly beings because they just look like humans. And so you're like, hmm. But then they also, they, they can just, boom, just appear out of nowhere. You know, they break the laws of physics and stuff like that. Uh, so, so they're very interesting, but they are servants. It says they're sent to serve. Um, now, they have different roles or functions. And, 
And uh, I could give you a whole Bible study on where this comes from, uh, but I'll just, I'll name a few of them. So one of the things that angels do is they communicate. Can anybody tell me the name of an angel, because sometimes they're named in scripture, that came and announced something? Gabriel. Okay, Michael. So you, yeah, so we're going to talk about these, these uh, angels you're describing. So Gabriel, uh, you see him showing up a lot in scripture when God has something very important. He's getting ready to intervene in human history, and, and he'll send an angelic messenger to, to make a proclamation. Uh, so who showed up when uh, John the Baptist, um, he appeared actually to, to John the Baptist's dad. It was Gabriel actually shows up and says, you're going to have this son in your old age. Um, he also shows up to a virgin named Mary and says, you're going to have a child. He's going to be the savior of the world. That's Gabriel. Um, scholars believe, those that study these things in depth, they believe that um, there are functions or divisions in the angelic host. So there are communicating angels and they say that Gabriel is like the archangel or he's sort of like the angel over other angels of, of the communicating angels. So Gabriel over the communicating angels. But then there are warrior angels. And so they show up in scripture and they're engaged in battle. Uh, you can read uh, some of that. Like if you just want a fun kind of wild read, read Daniel chapter 10 because <laughs> Michael shows up uh, in that in the Old Testament. Uh, Michael also shows up in the book of Revelation, uh, and, and when he shows up, he's kind of kicking tail and taking names. I mean, he, he's over the warrior angels, so that's Michael. Um, scholars tell us that there were originally three archangels. Uh, the other division of angels were angels over worship. They were responsible for worship. And there are angels in the book of Revelation that are around God's throne. And it says just day and night, they're just going, holy, holy, holy are you, God. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Uh, now, curious, who do you think was the original archangel over worship? Lucifer. Isn't that interesting? And, and, uh, and I could take you, like I said, on a little study through the Old Testament. Um, you can Google it out if you want. But basically... Um, there is some indication in the Old Testament that he was beautiful um, and majestic. And he got, basically, he was supposed to, his whole job was to, to use all of that glory and beauty, basically, just to demonstrate how awesome God is, that God would get the worship. But then he just kind of got into himself. And he's like, you know what? This whole worship of God thing that I'm in charge of, Actually, I want you all to turn it towards me, and I want that worship. And God said, uh-uh, not going to happen. You're out of here. We're going to look at that verse here in just a minute. Um, so my, my guess is that he was replaced after he was kicked out of heaven. Um, but that's, that's just an interesting thought. Um, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. I want to I wanna say this about angels, too. I don't have a slide. Hebrews 1, 14. I'll read it to you. It says, are not all angels ministering spirits. So again, they're servants. They minister. They, and it says, who are they sent out to serve? It says they're sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Who are the ones that inherit salvation? Say it, come on. Us. Yes, Christians. We are the ones who inherit salvation. So you guys know that one of the major responsibilities of these servant spirit beings is to serve you and to serve me. Does that sound crazy? It's like, really? We're not that important. Obviously, God thinks we are. And he says to the angels, you know what? I'm going to have you serve those who follow me. And so this gets really interesting. It's like, could there be, you guys, some angels hanging out around this room right now because you're here because I'm here and they're just kind of hanging around watching doing their angel thing I don't know what they're doing you know um, but they're but they're here 
How many times, you know, it's going to be fun when we get to heaven and then maybe we will get to see that movie where you should have died and that, you know, thing and whatever. And at the last second, you didn't. Right. And so, you know, anybody had some of those near I've had like a number of those near death things. And I'm like, you'll find out that that angel was holding back the thing or doing the, you know, I don't know. Um, but uh, here's an interesting verse I'm going to read to you. Uh, and I don't want you to build a doctrine off of one verse, okay? <laughs> but I'm just going to read it because it's interesting. It's Matthew 18.10. Matthew 18.10, and it's talking about children. So Jesus is talking about little children. Here's what he says. He says, See that you do not despise these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father. And you go, what does that Jesus mean? What are you talking about? This is where people get the idea over the centuries of guardian angels for children. Uh, you know, like those sweet, precious moments, you know, kind of, right? You with me? Um, so could it be that children are assigned an angel uh, to look after them, uh, talking to the father about them? Could that be? And uh, again, don't go and build a doctrine around that. It's a very interesting verse. But if it's true, just if it's true that an angel got assigned to you at childhood, did it leave when you turned 18? It's like, okay, you know, they're out of the house. They're on their own. You know, job's done, right? I don't know, you guys. I don't think they probably left when you were 18. So could it be that maybe they're still assigned to you? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe some of us have more than one because we need extra help, right? Are you with me? So I don't know. It's just interesting. But so angels, um, here's a question. Have any of you guys ever seen one? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Usually I get one or two or three hands that will go up uh, when I ask people, have you seen an angel? And um, angels in the Bible show up in all sorts of ways. When Paul the Apostle, remember he got knocked off of his donkey on the way uh, to, and he, you know, to go persecute Christians and, and uh, he saw Jesus and then he was struck blind. If you read that story in the book of Acts, it says that Paul saw a, in a vision, uh, an angel basically came to him in a vision uh, right after that happened and said, some dude's going to come and lay hands on you and pray for you. You're going to receive your sight. Uh, so angels show up sometimes in visions. And you go, well, what's a vision? Come to my Experiencing the Holy Spirit class in two weeks, because we're going to talk about visions. Uh, so sometimes they'll show up in visions. Um, sometimes they show up in dreams. And so um, the only encounter I have ever had with an angel that I know of is I had a dream that I know was from God. And that's too long of a story to tell. And in it, there was an angel. Uh, and this thing came kind of flying over in this dream that I was having. And I, I uh, so in the dream, okay, I'm convinced this was from God. <laughs> You're like, wow, who's this guy teaching this class? They really are letting him have the mic. Um, but uh, I was having a conversation with Jesus in this dream. I couldn't see him, but he was like right here. And he was talking into my ear. And I was asking him questions and he was just answering the questions. Um, then it got to a point, part where it's like, I would think the question, I didn't say it out loud, and he would answer it. Just, I'd think it, he'd answer it. I'd think it, he'd answer it. I asked him a few questions, and he goes, you can't know that. Like, like that's off limits. You can't handle that in your finiteness, okay? Um, so, but this thing came flying over, and I said, what is that? And he goes, that's one of the ancient ones. And I was like, okay. All right. Yes, sir. Jesus. All right. Um, now you guys are like, okay, can we, when's that break? <laughs> We're out of here. Um, so Jim Hall is convinced that he has seen an angel in bodily form. If you ever get, you need like a good 30 minutes to 45 minutes to hear Jim's angel story. Um, so if you're ever just hanging out with Jim, you're in a fishing boat with him or something. Jim, tell me that angel story. He's, he's, he's got a really fun one where he and Pam were at a place in their lives that was a really, really tough place. Very, very tough. Um, and I won't, I won't go into the details. He could tell you. Um, 
and they were at this, this Christian meeting, um, sort of a revival meeting, and this guy shows up and starts talking to them in line as they're trying to get in the door. And Jim's like, the guy just sort of presented sort of like a not completely playing with the full deck, you know, mentally sort of guy um, talking to us and pretty eccentric. But he's like, this guy knew stuff and said stuff that there's just absolutely no way he could sit, know those things and say those things. And at a certain part of the story, the guy just drops this sort of bomb on Jim and walks out the door and Jim's like, I, I gotta go, I gotta go like thank him or I gotta, I think, or maybe invite him out, you know, for, for dessert after this thing or whatever. The guy just walked around the corner. Jim goes bursting out there, goes around the corner. Dude is gone. Like just vanished. Jim's searching around. He runs out in the parking lot. He's looking in the bath. Like guy's gone. And he's, he's convinced it was an angel. And, and uh, so anyway, they can, they can appear um, all sorts of different ways. All right, have I messed with anybody yet? This isn't understanding the supernatural class. Uh, so um, I just want to maybe <laughs> blow our boxes out just a bit. <laughs> I always hesitate to do this at this part of the teach. Sometimes I think I should save this story to the end after I do all the Bible teaching, uh, you know, so at least you get that. If you, so, but I'm going to tell you a story, and please don't check out if you go, I don't know about that story, Kevin. And by the way, if you were in the class last week, you heard this story about my mentor uh, who had a very significant angelic encounter at a very dark time in his life. So I was mentored um, by a guy who uh, pastored churches for 55 years. He retired from pastoring when he was 79. Uh, he started in his 20s in coal mining country in West Virginia. His name was Hal Curtis. He just passed away this past year at the age of 85. Uh, and Hal and I uh, started a men's wilderness program that we ran outside of Glacier Park in Montana. It was basically, you know, like... Uh, like a discipleship training school, because I have a background. I used to run discipleship schools in this organization called Youth with a Mission, also known as YWAM. And this guy, Hal, was one of our, our most beloved speakers. He would come in every year, and he would teach for a whole week in our schools about spiritual warfare. And um, the reason he got connected with us is because, if you don't know anything about YWAM, this won't mean anything to you. But uh, So it was started by uh, a pastor named Lauren Cunningham, and uh, in 1960, it's actually the largest missions organization today, has the most staff around the world of any organization. Uh, and so in the 1970s, all of these missionaries were working in all these like really dark places around the world. And they were going into former Soviet countries or they were actually sneaking into Soviet countries, smuggling Bibles, things like that. Uh, and, and a lot of their missionaries were having all of these issues with spiritual warfare, and they didn't know what to do with it. They're like, all of our home churches did not teach about this. They didn't equip us for this. We don't know what to do. We're kind of just getting our tails kicked, and so we need some help. So Lauren Cunningham, the founder of the org, uh, asked my mentor, Hal, he said, Hal, you understand this stuff, and I'm going to tell you why you understood it in a second. He's like, you understand this stuff, so I need you to go teach all over the world in all of our bases and training schools on spiritual warfare. So he just happened to teach in my school uh, for a week. And then after that, he invited me to move to Montana and we started this amazing uh, wilderness discipleship program. Now, um, let me tell you a little bit about Hal's testimony and it'll give you insight into um, why he knew what he knew about spiritual warfare. So he was in military intelligence uh, back in the late 1950s uh, in the Air Force, and he was stationed in North Africa. And while he was, in, you know, serving there and he was doing military intelligence, his specialty was interrogation. And he was, he was a really good interrogator, and he studied humans and traits and all these things. And, uh, but in his study of interrogation, he got into studying hypnosis as a interrogation tool or method, which is kind of his own little side study. And uh, through his study of hypnosis, he started to study parapsychology. And through his study of parapsychology, he got involved in the occult. 
and he didn't really know what he was sort of messed up with. Um, he really didn't have a worldview or a paradigm that I'm going to talk about tonight uh, that evil has a personality and and it's volitional. It makes decisions. It it takes action. He thought it was more like, you know, Scott, you know, Luke Skywalker in the force, you know, the light side and the dark side, Darth Vader, you know, and it's like there's this like light, you know, energy in the universe and dark energy in the universe. Um, so that's how we got into some of this occultic stuff. But through that, he started messing with um, black magic. And so he was in his dorm room uh, one night and he had uh, what he described as sort of like a pagan altar set up on his dresser in his dorm room. <laughs> and he said his roommate was there in the room with him and they're just talking. And he said, all of a sudden, a floating head appears over this thing on his dresser said, my roommate saw it and ran screaming out of the room. And he said, and then this thing talked to me. And it basically offered him a deal. And it said, I'll serve you for this many years. And then after that, you'll serve me. And it completely freaked him out. He's like, nope, not going to do that. So he said, no, the thing disappeared. He was so scared. He threw it all in the trash. Within a week, he gave his life to Jesus, <laughs> okay? How's that for a testimony, right? Like, you don't hear those conversion stories every day, do you, right? So, so uh, but he said that after he had had that first encounter, um, he said just for like the next 10 years, he was just visited by these, these entities, these beings, really just to harass him and to torment him. And so he had to learn what he learned about spiritual warfare, literally like boots on the ground. Like I'm not just, you know, reading some book somewhere. It's like, I've got to learn how to do this uh, and get these things to leave me alone. And he said it was uh, not too long after that, within those 10 years that he got a call to ministry, he went to Bible college in central Pennsylvania. And he said while he was in Bible college in his dorm room one night is when he actually had one of God's angels appear to him in his dorm room. And that was right before he went home for Christmas break. His dad cussed him out for being a Christian, said, I'm going to disown you. I'm going to write you out of my will. I don't want you to be a blankety blanking Christian. Kicks him out of the house on Christmas Eve in a blizzard. And he has to hitchhike all the way back to Bible college. And he said that that encounter that he had had with one of God's angels, uh, it was just a strengthening thing in his life to prepare him for that ordeal that he went through with his dad. Uh, and that is actually where you'd also see angels show up in scripture. If you remember at the end of Jesus, 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness where he's being tempted by the devil, it says in one of the gospels that after that, it said angels came and strengthened him. They ministered to him. And he said that's what he felt like he experienced in his dorm room to prepare him. Fast forward. So now he's been pastoring for quite a while. He's moved from West Virginia to Montana. He's pastoring a church. And he said, the people in my church were being really, really mean to me. There was just some people that were just being nasty. And, and uh, he said, it was just breaking my heart. And he said, um, right around that time, he got hepatitis. And I don't know which kind it is, the one that wrecks your health like long term. Um, but he got, he got the bad kind of hepatitis, and uh, it really messed up his health. And then, uh, this is a really tragic part of the story, one day his, his second grade son, David, came home from school with a headache, and three days later, he died. He had some brain thing that was going on that they, at that time, the technology, they couldn't see it on the scans, they could have maybe saved him now with technology, but they couldn't, and so he loses his firstborn son. And not too long after that, his house catches fire and burns to the ground and they lose everything except the clothes on their backs, wedding pictures, little kid pick, everything. They lost everything. And so this is a bad time, right? Can you imagine? And so um, he, Hal's, Hal's just, he's, he's just a real guy, he, he, you know, trying to be faithful, follow God, but his heart is just done and so basically he said to God, God, I'm done with you. Like, I'm done with the ministry. I'm done with you. I'm just going to go just, you know, pursue something else. And 
basically like, you know where to find me if you want me, but I'm done with you. And shortly after this, he was getting ready to go hunting with some of his friends. And um, the night before he was going to go hunting, and they came to pick him up, he was in his bed. And he said he was awakened in the middle of the night. And there he's in his bed. His wife's here. He had a German Shepherd guard dog that always slept right by the bed. Uh, he's like, the dog doesn't wake up. My wife doesn't wake up. But there's a huge man standing by the side of my bed. And again, he, he just knows this is an angel because he's not the first time that he's seen one. And he said, this angel, this huge angel, just scooped me up out of the bed like I was just a little kid and is just holding me in its arms. And then it just starts to rise off the floor with me in its arms. And he's like, I think I was awake because I said I looked up at the ceiling and it's like, we're going to crash into the ceiling any second. And as soon as they, they got to the ceiling, he's like, he said it was like a hand went over his eyes and it was just like mist. He couldn't see anything. And then all of a sudden it was like, whoosh, the hand is taken away. And he said, I'm standing here in this place and the angel's like right here next to me. And he said, as far as you could see in every direction, just, he said it was just columns of light. As far as you could see, just columns of light in every direction. And he said there was this music. He's, he's like, I, I can't, he's like, I struggle to describe what the music was like. Because it's almost like he's like, the music was like alive. Like it was this big music. It was loud. and It was like swirling all around, almost like waves. He's like just swirling around us. He's like, it was the most beautiful music uh, you could imagine. He's like, it made you want to laugh and cry and run and jump and just this music. And he said in one direction, the light was so bright, he couldn't look into it. And he's like, I just knew that's where the presence of God is. And he said, I looked into the light, a voice spoke and it, to me out of the light. And he's like, it was the voice of God. And God spoke to him twice and said the same thing both times. And usually he wouldn't share it when he would. When he, I had to usually drag it out of him to get him to teach this story and tell it. Um, but uh, uh, sometimes he would tell people what God said. Sometimes he wouldn't. But it was really a word of correction. And basically, God was saying, Hal, you need to get your heart and your mind right. That's what God said to him. And then the part of the story that I, I really love, um, he said, right after God spoke, he said, the angel that was standing next to me took, took his arm and his hand like this, and the angel started to do this number, like, like look and see. And he said, as, as the angel kind of did this number, he quoted Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Which, if you don't know what that says, the angel basically said, For I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. So the angel quotes scripture. And then all of a sudden, he's like, whoosh, the hand is like back over my eyes. I can't see anything. And then all of a sudden, it's gone. And I'm in my bed. Wife's still sleeping. Dog's still sleeping. Angel's gone. And he's like, am I going to die? <laughs> Literally, that's what he thought. He's like, <laughs> am I gonna, you know, oh my gosh, what just happened? But if the story isn't already crazy, like, right? This is like an out of the box kind of story already. This next part uh, might get you. He said, I think I actually physically was in some place. He said, because that music had somehow absorbed into me and was coming out of me like a loudspeaker. He's like, I'm just laying there in the bed. Music's just coming out of me. Big music just coming out of me. He's like, oh my, what in the, you know. So he can't go back to sleep. He's getting ready to go deer hunting. So he's like, I might as well go down and cook breakfast. So he goes down, he's cooking his breakfast. Music's just coming out of him in the kitchen. So like, it's the craziest thing. Guy's coming to pick him up. Goes and gets in the back of the truck, you know, and uh, music's coming out of him. They can't hear it. So now he's just kind of putting his head back. And he's just starting to get his heart and mind right and just worship. He said, I walk out to my deer stand and I'm just in the deer stand and I'm just worshiping and just saying, okay, God, you're right. My present sufferings, they're, they're hard, but they're not worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed. And he said, as the sun came up, the music faded and faded and was gone. 
And you guys, he pastored for another 35 years. Um, one of the most impactful, probably the most impactful man uh, in my life um, and impacted so many lives. So I tell that story to kind of blow our boxes out just a little bit. Are you guys okay? <laughs> you okay? All right. Um, so so um, I tell the good story because now what I'm going to do is I'm going to transition <laughs> to the other spirit beings, okay? <laughs> How's that for a transition? Um, so we need to, uh, we've talked about the good guys, now we need to talk about the bad guys just a little bit. So, Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, I, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. What a terrible and awesome sight. Jesus was there when he was kicked out. Um, and then you can read about Lucifer losing his place and a third of the angels with him in Revelation 12. It's a long uh, couple verses, but I'll read them. It says, then war broke out in heaven. Michael, so there's Michael, head of the warrior angels. And it says, Michael and his angels. So like his division, right? The warrior division it says they fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels, they fought back. But he, which is Lucifer, was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, which means adversary, who leads the whole world astray. And we're going to talk about how he does that, uh, specifically next week. We're going to really get into how he does that and how we can resist. Um, so he leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And um, how many angels were, were cast out? Well, it says his tail. And again, this is figurative language, but uh, it, it, I believe it represents a third of the angels. It says a third of the stars. So in, a lot of times, too, when you see this in this type of apocalyptic language, stars aren't just like planets and suns out there. It's talking about angelic beings or, or spirit beings. Stars out of the sky were flung to the earth with them. So a third of the angels. Um, and then what we see is the nature of the battle. Revelation 12, 17, then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war. Who does the dragon wage war against? Against the rest of her offspring. Who are they? Uh, a lot of scholars think this is talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus, that she's the her in this verse. It's those who keep God's commandments and hold fast to their testimony of Jesus. That's Revelation 12, 17. So who does the devil target? Well, he targets everybody, but he particular, particularly targets the people of the light. Why does he do that? Why does he particularly target the people of the light? Because we are a threat to the darkness, amen? We're a threat. We're the ones that can actually tear down his kingdom. We're the ones that can actually resist and say, no, uh-uh, you're not going to do that in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. So he targets us. Let me keep going here. Uh, we're gonna, we'll take our break in about 10 minutes. Um, so we live in this world where spirit beings are present. And whether you believe in them or not, or you're coming to believe, this is the world that you've been born into. Not only born physically into, born spiritually into. And what we're going to look at in just a second are the words of Jesus that those of us who are his followers, we actually have our eyes opened to the realities. We're the ones that can actually discern and understand what's going on. Let's look at this really cool interaction. Well, it's interesting. Uh, I think it's cool, but um, Nicodemus was struggling. So this is John chapter 3, uh, and I'm going to read first... Um, uh, this is John 3. Uh, I thought I put it in my notes. Let's just say John 3. Um, you can look it up. Uh, yeah. Um, so Jesus says to this guy, Nicodemus, who is one of the Pharisees, so I tell you the truth. Unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Now, is Jesus talking about spiritual sight? Uh, I think he is. I think he's talking about unless you're born, and he's going to go into what he means by born again. Um, 
unless you have this spiritual change, you're not going to understand stuff. And then Jesus kind of does this lesson with Nicodemus. He says, and Nicodemus goes, what do you mean? And, and uh, he's like, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Is Nicodemus thinking naturally or is he thinking spiritually? Naturally. He's like, there ain't no way, Jesus. I know how all this stuff works. <laughs> uh, you only get born once. But Jesus says, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Scholars believe that the water, uh, people debate on what this means, but basically um, that, that um, born of water means born of a woman. Um, her water breaks, you're, you're born humanly, so you have to be born of a woman, but then you also have to be born of the spirit. You need to have spiritual birth. Uh, it says humans can only reproduce human life so there again, that's why they think water uh, about being humans being born. But the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So how do we understand spiritual things? We need to be born of the Holy Spirit. He says, don't be surprised. You have to, I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants. Uh, you can hear the wind, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. So, so he's having this dialogue with Nicodemus. And I want you to see how Nicodemus is thinking. Nicodemus goes, Jesus, how are these things possible? Again, is he thinking naturally or thinking spiritually? He's thinking naturally. This is how he's viewing reality. He's just thinking world, earth, five senses, biology. That's all he's thinking about. And Jesus replies and he says, you are a respected Jewish teacher. And yet you do not understand these things. Jesus is almost like, wait, you don't get like spiritual reality, do you? Like you got a lot of theology. You got a lot of Bible study. But you don't understand spiritual reality, Nicodemus. I assure you, we tell you of what we've seen and yet you won't believe our testimony. I think he's talking about the prophets. Uh, but if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? So these spiritual realities. And so Nicodemus is not prepared to receive spiritual realities. And the Apostle Paul also pastored churches where people in his congregation did not understand spiritual realities. I'll give you an example, the Corinthian church. So he says this, brothers and sisters. So these are believers. They have been born of the Spirit. They're followers of Jesus. But he goes, I can't address you as people who live by the Spirit. You're still worldly. What a, man, it's like, I don't want that said of me that, you know, it's like, like, I just am so focused on this world and the realities around me and just what's right here in front of my face that, that, that God would say of me, you're not spiritual. You don't understand spiritual reality. And then Philippians 3.19, he says to the Philippians, their minds are set on earthly things. So guys, I, I want us to just pause here. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or anything like that, but, um, but where are you, do you think, in your view and in your perspective? And are you aware of what is going on around you Naturally, but are you also aware spiritually of what's going on? Um, do, you, do you understand these realities? Um, I'll ask a second question. How is God exactly working in the 21st century? How, what's happening right now? What is God up to? Can miracles still happen? Does God still speak today? Um, can people hear him? Uh, are angels and demons doing things, and how can we know about it? Next week, uh, we're going to talk about how you can know or grow in your confidence to know, is this spiritual warfare or is this just a bad week? Um, we'll talk about that a little bit next week. Um, what I'm speaking into really is this language that philosophers call your worldview. 
So I've been using this word interchangeably, paradigm or worldview. These are the lenses, like I have lenses in my glasses. I look through these lenses because y'all are just fuzzy right now. I can sort of make you out there, but you know, uh, but I, I look through these lenses and they help me to interpret reality. And so your worldview, everybody has a worldview. Everybody has a set of lenses that you uh, interpret and understand reality through. And you may have taken a philosophy class in college or something and you studied worldviews or maybe you love this kind of stuff and, and um, you understand the different worldviews that we have today. But uh, if you're not sure where we are right now living in Northwest Arkansas is we are uh, what I would call children of the enlightenment. Another way of saying it is we are Western rationalist scientific in our worldview culturally. Other people will say it's, it's the Western view. We live in the West, um, living in the East. And when I say East, think India, China, you know, Far East, different, very different worldview there than we have uh, today. And if you trace that back in history, you really see a divide. Um, let me talk about this for just a second, because this is, uh, th these are the glasses that so many of us have. And a lot of times we don't know where the glasses came from, like who made them. And so... Um, the Enlightenment, especially uh, the Enlightenment that started in Europe in the 1600s, uh, really 15, 16, uh, and even carried into, uh, in a lot of ways, the 1800s. Um, these thinkers and philosophers in Europe, what they did is that at the time, if you remember the Enlightenment, it was, it was also the age of scientific discovery. And when I say scientific discovery, you have all these guys discovering, you know, gravity and other things and making telescopes. And so scientific advancement is going and also mathematical advancement is really taking off uh, modern mathematics. And so what what happened in culture is you've got math and science that are just taking off. And then you have these thinkers who are trying to embrace that and they apply it to their way of viewing reality, and they go, math is reasonable. Science operates by unbreakable laws that we can observe. And so when we think about reality, it has to be explainable, there has to be natural causes. Um, and so these thinkers sought to remove any idea of things that are spiritual or mystical, which up till the 1500s, you guys, Everybody in Europe believed in God. Like it was just a, it was just a fact. It's like we have a spiritual worldview and you see a real division in the 1500s uh, where that just starts to change. Um, you guys familiar with Rene Descartes? You remember that guy maybe from school? And, and so Descartes was the guy who uh, they say he's the guy, I think, therefore I am. He was a brilliant mathematician, uh, French philosopher and scientist, dubbed the father of modern Western philosophy. Um, and basically, he and his colleagues, they were, they were very against any sort of spiritual, mystical explanation for anything. I hope this is interesting. It's interesting to me, for sure. Fast forward to the 1800s. Now what happens in the 1800s in Europe is you have theologians who are running Bible schools and running seminaries. And these theologians, they sought to be relevant to the culture. Doesn't that sound good? It's like, we're gonna be relevant to the culture. I think maybe their hearts were in the right place, but they go, all this miraculous, spiritual angels, demons, miracles in the gospels and all that stuff, the culture doesn't like that stuff. They like math and science. So you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna take our Bibles and we're gonna cut out every miracle of Jesus. We're gonna cut out every reference to the supernatural. They literally did this. You can study it. It's called the higher criticism movement. And this all trickled down in all these seminaries in Europe. And so all of a sudden you have a secularized church culture in Europe. And then what was in Europe is spreading into the rest of the West, the United States, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is where we come to today. It's the waters that we swim in. It's the air that we breathe. Uh, we call this being secularized. And, and is this the culture that we live in today? 
You can say yes. Now, but people are actually becoming dissatisfied with it. They really are because they sense, because everybody's made in the image of God. And so everybody senses there's something more and there's got to be something higher. And so now people are becoming spiritual again. They have been for about the past 50 years, 60 years, uh, but they, they don't, they don't want to follow Jesus, but they're sensing that there's something spiritual. But basically it's a closed system, uh, according to the Western rationalists. Um, God doesn't speak today. Miracles have ceased. All right. I hope that was interesting. Was that interesting for, for anybody here? Okay, four of you. Okay, the rest of you, I'll work harder this next hour. Uh, so that's okay. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, man, I got to speed up. All right. Um, let me just, before we take our break, I'll put this up on the screen here and talk about a biblical worldview. I'll just introduce this, uh, talking about the Old Testament, and then we'll take our break and we'll pick it up in the New Testament. So there's a story in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17, and it's the story of Elisha. And basically, Elisha is in this city. The city is surrounded by enemy armies, overwhelming odds. All the people in the city are like, we are going to die today. Like, it's a fact. We're all going to die. Uh, and Elisha has a servant who's there with him. But the servant is freaking out, and Elisha... It's just kind of cool as a cucumber. He's just like, hey, we're going to be fine. And the servant is freaking out like there ain't no way we're all going to die today. And then Elisha does this thing. He prays. And he says, Lord, would you open my servant's eyes to see the reality that is around us? And what happens? His eyes are open. What's he see? Angels cherry on chariots of fire surrounding the city. Now, were they there before the servant could see them? Yes, they were. Um, they were. They were very real. The servant just couldn't see them. All he could see are physical realities around him. The book of Job, um, very interesting book. Um, I like to do this little exercise. Just imagine on the 6 o'clock news tomorrow night, you hear a story about a huge wind that just comes out and it hits a, a, a structure and it collapses the structure and a bunch of people get killed. And you, and you go, dang, man, that's like straight line winds. Oh, that's terrible. And then you hear about another story about lightning falling from the sky and, and, and killing some people or some livestock. And you go, man, that's a bad electrical storm. And then, and then you hear about um, somebody who's just covered with just this physical infirmity, almost like the plague, and they just, you know, it's this, this weird new disease, and they're covered with it, and it's so painful. And you go, man, that's so awful. That's just some kind of, some kind of new disease. We better find an immunization for that one. Um, and then you hear a story about these, these really evil people or raiders or robbers that kind of come down, and they steal a bunch of stuff, and they head off you know, with a bunch of loot, and you go, there's some really bad people stealing some stuff. And then you hear a story about a guy who, um, you know, maybe this pastor who, who really was, you know, believing in God, um, but became really, really discouraged. Um, and then you dig a little deeper, you find out it was his wife who was really discouraging him. He's having a bad week, right? If you heard about all this stuff on the nightly news, wouldn't you just be tempted to go, there is a rational, logical, like natural explanation for all that stuff. If you read, if like if the book of Job was on the six o'clock news, how many of us today would go, yep, wow, that's really bad. That's a bad week. But what the book of Job tells us is every single one of those things I described as a spirit world cause. Interesting, isn't it? How many things that happen in our world and we hear about, we see, um, maybe there's, there's more of an explanation there. Are you with me? I'm just trying to get us to kind of uh, stretch our thinking a little bit. And of course, we get to the book of <laughs> Acts, the Gospels. By the way, our God um, came back from the dead. I think that's kind of a supernatural experience. And the book of Acts, again, when you read the book of Acts, I kind of go, 
What's normal? What's normal? And a lot of times we want to explain it away and go, oh, yeah, that was 2,000 years ago and it was for the beginning of the church, but you know, after the church got formed and we got the Bible and we didn't need all that stuff anymore. And I'm like, oh, really? We don't need any of that stuff anymore? <laughs> um, last time I checked, things are still really bad. Jesus hasn't come back yet. And uh, I think the devil's still up to some stuff. So um, coming into a supernatural paradigm is, is incredibly important for us. Let's take our break. And when we come back, what I'm going to do, I'll just tell you where we're going. I'm going to just get into a few New Testament um, verses. And then we're going to talk specifically about the Holy Spirit and how we can start to become naturally supernatural.